do you know what political party you belong in? That is a key question facing Republicans after Donald Trump's presidency. The GOP says its supporters know exactly what they stand for. America is an exceptional nation, the greatest on earth. We need to uphold the Constitution. Leaders should serve people and not special interests. We need to strengthen the military, respect law enforcement, and protect life. This is one way to define the soul of GOP ideology. But when it comes to how we actually vote, does that soul matter a bit less when Donald Trump is your messiah? It's not just difficult for voters, but for some leaders on Capitol Hill. Trump and I, have, we've had a hell of a journey. I hate it being this way. Oh my God, I hate it. From my point of view, he's been a consequential president. But today, first thing you'll see. All I can say is uh, count me out, enough is enough. That was Senator Lindsey Graham the day after the insurrection. Here he is yesterday. I would just say to my Republican colleagues, can we move forward uh, without President Trump? The answer is no. I've always liked Liz Cheney, but she's made a determination that the Republican Party can't, can't grow with President Trump. I've determined we can't grow without him. Or consider Senator Ted Cruz, formerly, former President Trump publicly smeared Cruz's wife, and the senator called Donald Trump a sniveling coward, a pathological liar, and a serial philanderer, among other things. But today, he is among the most ardently pro-Trump senators. Some former staffers claim that they now barely recognize the man or his views. Senator Mitch McConnell gave a strong statement against the former president following the attack on the Capitol. He went back on that later in an interview with Fox News. If the president was the party's nominee, would you support him? Uh, the nominee of the party? Absolutely. And what was his reward for his loyalty? A tirade in which Donald Trump called him a dumb son of a bee and a stone cold loser. But it's easy to see why so many Republicans are willing to stick with the former president. Look what happened this week to Senator Mitt Romney. Now, you know me as a person who, uh, who says what he thinks, and I don't hide the fact that I wasn't a fan of our last president's character issues. And I'm also no fan. According to a recent CNBC survey, three out of four Republicans say Donald Trump should stay in politics. About half of them want him to remain the head of the GOP. So what is it this party now stands for? Is it whatever Donald Trump says? Or is there more to it? And what will that look like going into the next presidential race? Let's discuss it with Larry Sabato, a professor at the University of Virginia and director of its Center for Politics, and Arkansas State Senator Jim Hendren. In February, he announced that he was leaving the Republican Party. He is now an independent. Gentlemen, it's good to have you with us tonight. Senator Hendren, let me start with you. What was the last straw for you? Was there a particular moment or an occurrence, a happening that made you know, this is it, it's time to leave the GOP? Senator, I think we're having some trouble with your line. I'm going to come right back to you. If you can hear me, Senator Hendren, sit tight. I'm going to come back to you. We're having a little trouble with your line. But Larry, let me come over to you, Professor, for just a minute in terms of the view of Republicans, which is not necessarily the most favorable. The most recent Pew Research poll shows that just 38 percent of Americans view the Republican Party in a positive light. How much of that do you think has to do with the values that the Republican Party espouses in terms of what people think of when they think of the GOP? Joshua, uh, there are only three things that I can really think of that the Republican Party believes in today. The first is, of course, the golden calf, the head of the cult, uh, Donald Trump. The second would be that uh, January 6th didn't matter uh, because uh, those were good people who loved the police and probably it was Antifa if they really looked into it more thoroughly. And third, uh, the election was stolen. That must be believed. That's one of the central tenets. You must believe the election was stolen. And therefore, the number one goal of your policymakers in all of the states, as well as the Congress, is to find election integrity. 
uh, and find ways uh, to achieve it, which incidentally, and I'm sure it's accidental and coincidental, suppresses the vote of those who are inclined to support the other party. That's it. Well, Professor, but I think there are a number of Republicans who would say, well, yeah, that may be what some of the loudest mouths in our party think, but I still believe in, you know, small government and fiscal conservatism and a strong, you know, national defense, that all of those values that Republicans had espoused in the past, that they still believe in, even while all of this other stuff is happening at the top in terms of the fight for the soul of the party. Well, they may say that. Explain to me then why they are ditching Liz Cheney, who has a nearly perfect record of support for all the things you just said, to support Elise Stefanik, Congresswoman Stefanik, who in fact has uh, a half and half record, really, of support for Donald Trump and for some of those basic principles of the Republican Party. Explain that to me, and you can't. State Senator Hendren, I think we've cleaned up your line a little bit. Let me ask you the question that I started with. What was the last straw for you? Was there a moment when you knew that it was the right time for you to leave the GOP? Well, clearly the last straw for me was January the 6th, but it had been building for quite some time. Uh, everybody has to ask themselves, how much can they take before you, before you break? Uh, but when I saw leaders of our party holding stop the steal rallies, continuing to advance this notion that the election was stolen, stolen, which led to an insurrection. Uh, I said, I can no longer be part of that anymore. To see people storming our, our, our U.S. Capitol, I spent 25 years in the military, and that, that made an impact on me that I'll, I'll never forget. And to continue in a party, even after that occurred, and you, the, tape, the clip you paid, played of Lindsey Graham, we had a moment of revival, but then we forgot. And we got right back to, uh, it's not about principle, it's about protecting the Trump base or being the heir to the Trump base. I'm not gonna spend my political career advancing lies in order to get political uh, advantage. And that's what I see happening in the Republican Party. How much before you left the party, when you considered yourself a, a party member in, in good solid standing, how much of the, ongoing debate over Donald Trump affected your sense of loyalty to the party. I'm assuming that as a Republican, there were some aspects of his policy platform that you liked and some you didn't, some aspects of his personality you liked and some you didn't, that, that there was kind of an evolution in the way that you, you know, decided to give up your party membership. Well, that's right. I'll tell you, there were two things that were factors for me, major factors, along with others. But the first one was the tone and the civility and the hatred that we saw being spewed on Twitter and the name calling and that kind of hateful attitude. And now what I see is Republicans imitating that because it worked and because it was successful. And the other thing for me was when I saw us betray our allies as a military guy, I had been to the Middle East. I all right, Senator, let me ask you to hold on just one more second. We're having a little more signal trouble with you. I, I will clean it up as best we can. Sit tight. I want to come back to you. But Professor Sabato, let me ask you about Virginia now. There's a nominating convention going on this weekend for who is going to run for governor. Uh, Virginia Republicans who spoke to the New York Times have said that the party is nominating kind of Trump-like candidates who focus on a number of polarizing social issues. Virginia is an interesting state because Northern Virginia and Southern Virginia can feel like two very different states. Northern Virginia, you've got the very, very strong political influence of the DC metro area, which politically can feel very different than, you know, Richmond and, and Virginia Beach and, and some other parts of the, of the state. What is your sense of what's happening in area, states like Virginia, where you do have some Republican Democratic jousting back and forth in terms of what the future of the party is going to be and what state politics are going to look like? Well, look, the Republicans are, are stuck uh, in a rut. Uh, they keep nominating people that are too far to the right for this newly moderate state. In some areas like Northern Virginia, moderate liberal, in other areas, Richmond and parts of Hampton Roads, I think just plain moderate. Uh, Republicans would have a chance if they nominated people like the ones they used to nominate. For example, Senator John Warner, and I'm sure you remember him, just to, just to mention one. 
the candidates who are running for governor, there are seven of them uh, who are going to be competing tomorrow in this very strange, unassembled convention, uh, you can put them into three categories. Uh, and they're very diverse. Uh, some of them are Trumpy, some of them are Trumpier, and others are Trumpiest. So that's the choice. That narrows and it all the way down. Trumpy, Trumpy, or Trumpy. Down. I hope that made it clear for you. It did. It couldn't have been no clearer. <clears throat> well, but then where does that kind of leave us, Professor? I mean, if, if it's just a matter of how Trumpy you are, then that would seem to be all she wrote. Maybe it will shake out where Republican voters kind of like it like that. It may be distasteful to people who aren't Republicans, but if that's not your bag, then... You know that's not the party for you. I mean, at the end of the day, Professor, if that is what the Republican Party turns into avowedly, the, the party of, the, of the, the Trumpiest of the Trumpy, then is there some value in that, at least in just clarifying, well, okay, now we know what we're dealing with? Well, it would be clarifying if the determination were made on the basis of policies and issues. But as we all know by now, after all these years of Donald Trump, it's based on the personality of the leader. That's why many of us refer to them as a cult. And there are very few people like the senator who have the courage to stand up and say, that's not why I got into politics. It's not why I identified with the Republican Party. Uh, so what, what incentive do they have to change in most of the red states, the deeply red states? Because they can continue to win no matter how far right they go. And Arkansas is a perfect example. Virginia, and I think increasingly Georgia, and eventually North Carolina, and Texas eventually, uh, those are states that are moderating because of the demographics. New people moving in, not just immigrants, but people from other parts of the country who have very different views of politics. Yeah. This is going to be tougher and tougher for Republicans to win uh, statewide, uh, unless it's a, an, an extraordinary year and Demo a Democratic president is very unpopular. Something like that would be necessary for a Republican to win. University of Virginia Professor Larry Sabato and Arkansas State Senator Jim Hendren. Senator, I'm sorry we had so much trouble with your line. I'd love to have you back on to talk about this another time. But for now, I appreciate y'all making time. Thanks very much.